Okay, well, welcome to the seminar series. Uh, let me preface this talk by saying that we've been expanding tracks and thinking about what tracks should be within the Large Simulation Grant Program. And one of them is cyber issues. So you'll see brochures up here when you go past it. We have modeling and simulation of behavioral, behavioral cybersecurity. Uh, nice subspecialty. And uh, it's a certificate program, but it's been designed so of course it can apply toward a master's degree. So <coughs> just being a certificate, it also is accountable graduate books is sort of considered. And in prep for that, uh, with Eric Ortiz, who is a PhD student in the modeling simulation program, and he was selected by the modeling simulation department to complete a graduate certificate program. It's an odd coincidence, right? <laughs> Uh, in foundation of cybersecurity at the University of Maryland. You may know the University of Maryland is situationally well located for security stuff, as is Hopkins. Uh, I think NSA is right there and, and so on. And so we thought that would be a good starting point for seeing how it's done and what sort of things they think are important. So Eric has completed that program. As part of his dissertation, Mr. Ortiz will reference the knowledge gain from the civic program, focused research on the theoretical foundations for developing cybersecurity training. His research will provide UCF and ISD a foundation for future cybersecurity training endeavors. A further subnote to this, I don't know if you're aware, but the, the uh, UCF Cyber Protect Team is number one in the nation this year. And so that gives us a little groundwork, and, and I think almost a unique opportunity because we have 200 people that are interested in hacking who can be human subjects in how you train people in that program uh, that might not be available just using graduate students or others who have no background. So that's actually a big plus. It's also a very big growth area, and the piece that we have, we IST and UCF in general have carved out is, what about the human side? How do you train people for this? How do you select people that are suitable for these kinds of occupations. How do you do team behavior in these kinds of things? How do you deal with the insider threat? So these are all things that are part of the student <coughs> program and part of the overall program. So this is a, a niche that I think we're well prepared to, to take on and uh, there will be a more fun about it. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, you got to make sure I'm on camera. Good? All right. So little. I'm still small. All right. So again, my name is Eric Ortiz. Thank you for all some, some familiar faces, some unfamiliar faces. Thank you all for coming to this talk. For the next half hour or 45 minutes or so, I'm going to dazzle you <laughs> with everything cybersecurity. I'm just joking. I'm just setting you up for a, for a, big, for a big failure at the end. No. I'm going to make a simple conversation about the theoretical foundations for developing cybersecurity training. So my background, my brief background is I've been doing virtual environment development for the past 20 years in the DOD realm. So cybersecurity and, and virtual environments kind of kind of going hand in hand. So that's how I came into the picture with this. Uh, I've gone, I've done everything from developing um, virtual environments to virtual environment scenarios. And over the past 20 years, I've learned a lot. So shall we begin? All right. So. This paper was, this, this presentation is based on a paper I wrote for the HCII conference that'll be coming out in, I think it's July. Sound familiar? August? All right, that time frame. So that, I'm gonna be over there in Los Angeles. Okay, so, hold on. Gotta work both things here. So what is cybersecurity? So everybody has an, a concept of what cybersecurity is. So on a high level, cybersecurity is detection, anticipation, and prevention of unauthorized access. So unauthorized access to a computer system, to your network, to your home system. It can be from anywhere from hackers to uh, terrorist groups. Anybody can basically try to get into a system. All right. So some fun facts right now for you. Let's take a few seconds to read these over. Uh, cyber attacks against big companies surged by 40% in 2014. That's incredible. It's growing exponentially all the time. Nearly one million new malware threats are released every day. That's every day. So, I mean, this, this is something that we're living, living all the time. This is something that's it's part of our lifestyle now. According to Verizon, 40% of malware was downloaded through email attachments. 40% of hacking took place, uh, uh, hacking with stolen credentials, and 77% of social engineering takes place through phishing. So basically, 47% 47, 47 of people have clicked on an email attachment that they probably shouldn't have and it launched some malware onto their system. 
could cause a virus, could cause a Trojan, could cause anything. 40% 40 of hacking took place with stolen credentials. That's basically somebody stealing your, your information, somebody stealing your, your, your identity. And 77% of social, social engineering takes place through phishing. Uh, what a phishing scam is, basically, you get an email from Bank of America saying, hey, your account's been hacked. Oh, I'm sorry. You get an email from Bank of America saying, hey, we need your password to get into your system or get into your account. So you send it right back to them. You just been you just been scammed. Okay, so that's somebody else sending sending you a a, a bad piece of uh, information trying to get trying to get your information. So those are just little fun facts. So the, this purpose of the presentation will focus upon the human component of cybersecurity. That's what I'm most interested in. I'm not really uh, I'm not going to talk about the firewalls or the the networks. I'm going to talk about the human component. And at the end, I'll have a call to action. And the call to action is regarding information, developing cybersecurity training and experimentation environments. Okay, so now onto the human threat. Everybody recognizes this guy's face? It's, yeah, Eric Snowden. Okay, so basically what he did is he used his position as a contractor with Booz Allen, contractor to the NSA, to leak thousands of uh, top secret classified documents. Now these documents detail the, co the government's covert surveillance and eavesdropping missions to the public. Now I'm not gonna get into the reasons, his motivations, why he did this. I'm just gonna basically say, he did, okay? And it's it's a threat. It's an it's an insider threat. Okay? Now his motivations could be, you know, across the board, but basically he did it. Okay. So a cyber attack. As information expands, data must be protected. We all know that. We all deal with computers every day. This is not new to anybody. But a cyber intrusion can present itself from malware to viruses to disgruntled employees. That's somebody who's just not happy with their job. Okay? They could steal IP, they can steal information, they could, they could steal IP and sell it to somebody else. Okay, so the Snowden incident, for me, it just identified the human threat as a major contributing factor highlighting weaknesses in the present state of US cybersecurity affairs. Basically, what that did is it showed the human component is important and we need to look at that. We've all known all along you gotta protect your firewall, you gotta protect your, your networks and you gotta protect your passwords, but the human component is important too because it's the, it's the humans that, that, that are doing these things. They're the ones that are guilty of this stuff. Oops. There you go. All right. So a lot of times cybersecurity is reactionary. Organizations react when something happens. They got, they got hacked. Oh my, now I got to react. Now I got to do something about that. Okay. This offensive reaction is to prevent further damage or determine the cause or impact of the breach. There's also, you could also be preventative by setting up with more secure firewalls and stuff like that. That, that prevents a situation from, from happening. Okay. See, I was gonna be behind here with my notes on the screen, so I gotta do it this way, old school style, so I apologize. Let me, let me follow along. Okay. So on to the human component. In many organizations, emphasis is placed on the technology rather than the human. But the human is one of the most vulnerable aspects of it. The human element is frequently, is frequently referred to as the weakest link in the chain. And there's for multiple reasons with that, and I'm going to go into that in a little bit. So a human threat can either be outside or inside and stem from people with various reasons. It can be unintentional or intentional. Unintentional uh, meaning you walked away and didn't leave your and, and didn't lock your computer down or intentional where you saw somebody left their computer unlocked, you went in there and you started tampering with their information. Okay, so employees can unintentionally make the organizations vulnerable because they are careless at following security protocols. Okay, that could be anything from, like I said, walking away or tailgating into a restricted area without using proper credentials. Now, intentional vulnerabilities can range from financial to revenge. So this form of exposure is challenging because it can stem from anyone within an organization willing to take advantage of, uh, of the information they have. Now, if you look at this picture, let me stay on camera. You got a careless user, you got pay, uh, payment, card, uh, payment card breach, industrial espionage, data theft, IT sabotage. Those are all aspects of, of cybersecurity and, and human vulnerabilities and people, doing the, the, and people taking advantage of a situation. So there are multiple hacker types, okay? 
Everybody's heard of a black hat, a white hat, and a gray hat? Yes? Well, basically what the white hat, or white hat is, is uh, they help, they, they try to expose security flaws. They're considered the law enforcement of cybersecurity. They're considered the good guys, okay? Now the black hat, on the other hand, they're considered the bad guys. They thrive on the ability to infiltrate a network. And they, you know, they kind of advertise their hacks to gain notoriety. You've heard about them in the, on, the, on, the, on the news. You know, this, this hacking group got into this network and did this thing. And they're, they're basically proud of it. They're, they're, they're saying, this is what we do. You guys, your security is so weak, this is what we did to get in there. Okay? Now, your gray hats is kind of a newer, the newer concept. And they're, they're called the ethical hackers. And they typically hack into a system to check for weaknesses or report findings. So basically, you, know, you, may get, you may have somebody hack into your system and they call you up and say, hey, you may not know this, but I was able to get into your system, calling a big organization. You know, they, they basically tell them, hey, you've got to pay attention to what you have here because you're not secure because I got in. I'm not going to say who they are, but they're saying somebody was able to get in. Okay. Why? Eric, why sure. are the black hatters, as you described them, the bad guys? in the sense that they are doing it for notoriety sure. as opposed to ones that are doing it without exposing the fact that they've infiltrated a network. Those would seem to be the real bad guys. Well, that's the interesting thing. Is they, all, they can change hats. You can be a black hat today and be a gray hat tomorrow or, or, or switch it up. It just depends on what your purpose is. So that's, that's, that's the scary thing about it. You can, and anyone in here can be a hacker. You can be sitting next to one. You may not know it. They don't, there's no rhyme or reason, you know, they don't look like a certain person. They don't look like that guy in the screen that I showed you before. They look like you and you and me and her and her and him. Anybody can be a hacker. Okay. So in this situation, this is a, uh, this is a, 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 a gray hat hacker incident, incident happened at a Dawson College in Montreal, Canada. And what this guy basically did, not this guy specifically, he just fit, he fit the description of a college student. He does not have a gray hat. So I was going to go in and Photoshop and make his hat gray, but I wanted to focus on the rest of the presentation. So basically what this guy did is uh, he found a flaw in the computer system for his, uh, for his school, and it affected 250,000 students. Now, the now, some of you have heard about this already, but the crazy thing about this was he got expelled. You know, hey, thanks, thanks for the information. You hacked into our system. Love you, mean it. Now you gotta go. So, the interesting thing is, right after that, after he was expelled, the same company that he hacked into, or showed that he could be able to hack into, hired him or gave a job offer, among several other companies. So, I mean, it happens. Okay, let me catch up to myself. Okay, so the impact of human vulnerabilities. So our enemies in cyberspace, in cyberspace can include spies in search of business secrets, some interested in stealing IP, they can be criminals interested in stealing money, money and identities, or terrorists wanting to hack into critical infrastructures. Now, I've been a victim, and I'm sure this, there's been a couple of you in here that have been a victim of somebody, of uh, uh, part number two. Somebody had got into my bank account, and I was in Tropical Smoothie um, you know, a couple months ago, and I get, I get a phone call about an hour later, hey, we noticed you in Tropical Smoothie in Orlando, but 20 minutes later, you were in Kansas. Now that's impossible. Somebody got my debit card information, and as you know, they tried they tried going to a Wawa in uh, in Kansas. I was in Wichita, Kansas, and I uh, tried buying a you know bag of honey buns. Okay, but that's how they do. They they first go in and try to get something small, bag of honey buns, uh, you know, a soda to see if they can use that number. Once they know that number is good to go, they head right to Best Buy or Circuit City or one of these bigger department stores, and they start buying the TVs and the computers and all the high price things. So thankfully, my bank notified me and I said, no, I'm still here. As a matter of fact, I'm at work. So uh, I had to cancel that, that account and switch cards and all that. Two weeks later, still in a headache. But anybody else been a victim of that here? You? A lot. See, it's, it's, it's very common. It's unfortunate, but that's the, that's the world we live in now. And then terrorists, that's another interesting thing. You know, if a terrorist wants to get into, let's say, the, uh, the electric grid, and they're able to get in, they could bring down the whole network. Now, that's a scary thing. I mean, we're not just about losing electricity. We're talking about things that, 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 run, that run the system, run the, run the country, hospital systems or uh, the Hoover Dam or, or major critical infrastructures. That's a scary aspect. So we're hoping, or I'm hoping, I'm sure you are too, that the people that are in charge of this cyber stuff are paying attention to this kind of stuff. So based upon all this, the human is an important factor of cybersecurity because it's individuals and their actions that are committing this behavior. 
So basically, it's us. It's one of us. Okay? And it can happen, uh, you know, a virus can be introduced by a disgruntled IT analyst with full rights to a network, or it can be somebody downloading software to play music that contains malware, or it can be an overworked IT manager that forgets to install software patches, leaving network systems vulnerable. That happens. That's an everyday occurrence. So the impact of the, of the human side or, or cyber, a cyber event can create widespread damage potentially impacting revenue, organizational productivity, organizational trust. Now, we all know what happened at Target in 2013. You know, somebody got in or, or a team got in, they stole up to 70 million people's credit card information. Okay? Anybody here been, were a victim of that? Right there? You see? It's, so it's, it's anytime I've, I've mentioned a cyber event, somebody has been affected by it. So I'm giving all this background information on cyberspace. I'm going to get to the good stuff in a little bit. This is just background stuff. Okay. So because the human component is a critical factor in cybersecurity, policy, training, and education based on sound science all play an important role in understanding and reducing cyber risk. If you're not aware of the problem, then you, then you're, 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 you don't know. So right now, you've got to develop, or well, the government is in the process of de developing policies based on Snowden and other events that have occurred. But education is also key. Everybody has to take some sort of cyber event, cybersecurity training right now. But is it enough? And is it, is it effective? And that's kind of the question we're looking at as well. Hold on, let me catch up with myself. All right. So oftentimes, users are naive in the cybersecurity issues. Again, training and education is key. Uh, it also applies to those responsible for policy implementation and those involved with organization-wide security efforts. You want your IT guys to all be very engrossed in cybersecurity and cyber events and, 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 and potential impacts. You want them to know. You don't want them to fall asleep at the wheel and, and not, not, make, not install the, the right software patches. You know, in a smaller institution, it may not be a big issue, but a, but a Fortune 100 company, these guys have to be on their toes because cyber, cyber attacks happen all the time daily. So here we get some, some interesting stuff. So cybersecurity training, training and experimentation environments. A challenge of training on the human component of cybersecurity is the current training environments are liter, liter, limited in their ability to convey complex and dynamic situations. And training curriculum is limited by inadequate environments available for cybersecurity experimentation, uh, leading to valid training materials. Now basically what this means is, since the cyberscape changes daily, and it does, we see that you know in the beginning of every, every day, I don't know how many it was, malware, uh, malware threats come out. OK, you've got to be able to adjust for that every day in a training cycle. OK, that, that's, that's, that's difficult. So we've got, to, we've got to try to figure out a way to, to make a complex situation or, or work on making a complex situation or dynamic situation um, current in a training environment. So the military are real good at doing this. They've utilized VEs and games. Uh, to enhance performance and increase training retention. Um, the, the military uses VEs or virtual environments and simulations for everything from, from marksmanship training to, to uh, room clearing procedures, uh, you know. But it's not limited to those. They, they, the military is using the, the VEs for, for everything right now, and they, they use it to practice various techniques, succeeds, and procedures, all with high-fidelity 3, 3, uh, 3D components. <clears throat> So current training experimentation environments for cybersecurity vary in sophistication. And they're usually self-paced, and they include text-based informational pages and evaluation forms to access information retention. So basically, uh, in my, in my, in my uh, program that I took, most of the testing I had to take was click next to continue, click next to continue, OK? Um, they tested me at the end to make sure I knew what I was talking about, but it wasn't very engaging. And I could just basically keep clicking through to get to, get to the end. So I really, did I really retain it? Did I really, learn, did I learn anything? Okay. So, you know, then you have some games a little more sophisticated, but again, it's, it's, it's one of these things where it's, 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 it goes according to a timeline or a pattern. It's not, it's not engaging. And the, the Army's currently using um, the cyber, DOD Cyber Awareness Challenge training that all Army, all Army uh, has to take anybody who uses the, um, it's a requirement for anybody using Army networks. 
And I got this right off the internet. So this is just, this is part of their training. And I have not seen the training, but I, I got a feeling it's, it's on the same realm of click next to continue. Can anybody confirm that for me? Yes. It's click next to continue, right? So you're going to learn, so you're going to get some out of it, but it's not very dynamic, not very intuitive, and that doesn't keep you kind of, it's like one of the things you, you look at it like, I just, I got to take this training. But are you getting something out of it? You know, and that's the next question. Very long time. Okay, good. All right. So these current environments do provide training and the ability to test even component cybersecurity, but they do not capture the complexity of cybersecurity for effective long-term training. Like I said, cyber events happen daily and it switches all the time. We've got to be dynamic. We've got to be able to change that stuff because it's, it's fluid. It's always happening. Somebody, hackers have plenty of time to sit down and figure out a way to try to get into your system or into a system. That's all they got is time and they're going to do it. And, and hacker, again, hacker could be anybody. They could be sitting right next to you. So that's why this, this illustration kind of shows, you know, it's very complex and very interwoven because that's how complex cybersecurity is. You know, I'm going at a high level right now, but we know we get down into the weeds of cybersecurity. There's so many different aspects of it that, that I don't even have all day to tell you about. So what's the next step? So a seventh direction of uh, matching current training capabilities used by the military and other domains is to create, in my opinion, some sort of high fidelity cybersecurity gaming environments. Something that's going to be intuitive, something that's going to keep you paying attention. Uh, high fidelity meaning uh, the, the graphics, everything is everything is, is is crisp and clean, very very looks looks realism or real, looks realistic. That's what I mean by high fidelity. So we all know the benefits. Everybody in here, DoD, MNS, all know the benefits of gaming and virtual environments. Okay, you're able to control and manipulate variables, scenarios, content, design, task flow, things like login. We all know that. So, again, the, the, you're able to, to accurately measure phenomenon. Gaming components and Vs also include the ability to review past cyber incidents. So let's say we made a, we made a, a, a high fidelity cyber uh, training, a, training a simulation. We can go back and, 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 and replay what the cyber incident we were trying to teach the, the user on and you can you can mitigate the negative outcome by doing things over and over again. That's modeling and simulation. That's that's basically you know computer-based training, simulation simulation-based training. It's able to go back and redo what you did. So like an AAR. And this capability empowers trainees to see multiple outcomes, successful and consequential, and it reduces uh, reducing time and cost for the training. Catch up to myself. So in order to strengthen cyber defenses, and I'm gonna see some smiles from a bunch of the researchers in here is, hold on, I'm there, I'm there. You need a solid, a solid theoretical research foundation in order to, and to, be able to, to, to be able to understand these vulnerabilities. Training experimentation can provide insight into current cybersecurity training methods and how they can be transitioned and implemented into future, future training regimens. This is key. You, experimentation is gonna help you understand what's next uh, and how you, can, you have, can adapt and modify that. So here's a call to action. Developing environments that are controllable and interactive appears to be the right next step in advancing training and experimentation for cybersecurity. But the execution needs to uh, require several hurdles to be overcome by multiple inter interdisciplinary communities. I mean academia, industry, government, all playing a hand, working together to understand what the, what the need is and how to help that, you know, how to help to, you know, mitigate that threat. Now, some of the stuff I'm interested in, you know, the present challenges, and something that you know, I was going to talk to you guys about is, you know, in your opinions, what components of cybersecurity, basically we know in the complexity of, of, of the cyberspace, the cyber world, we know how complex it is. What components of a cybersecurity scenario should be built into an environment that would effectively uh, train the task that you're trying to work on? How do we simulate the human component? Should this be dynamic? Should it be real time? Should it be, should it be fixed? Uh, dynamic meaning it, it's, it's always changing. Real time, it is, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a system that's always running, or is it fixed? And how should scientific findings be distributed without becoming a, a cybersecurity vulnerability for organizations or for the government? You know, once we come up with, with these nice solutions, is it gonna tell the hackers, hey, we know how this works, now go ahead and do it. And you, now you go ahead and use this. So we, we've gotta stay one, one step ahead of the curve. Thank you for attending. That's it. <laughs> Any questions? Sure. Um, what are the challenges uh, 
with hackers mm -hmm. is that they do have a lot of time and they treat it as a game. Yeah. Uh, their whole their whole orientation is to beat the machine. Cat and mouse. Um, that's a real problem because you're going to have to fundamentally figure out a way to change their mentality uh, because most of them live in the basement and mm -hmm. drink jolt coal and mom pays for their laundry. Do they? Uh, well, I don't know. No, I, they I, don't. <laughs> but they obviously have a lot of time. Yeah. Because clearly Plenty hacking time. requires a lot of time on their hands. Sure. Um, so the, I don't know how to fix that problem. Mm -hmm. I have one solution, but it's my somewhat over-the-top militant solution that okay. we won't talk about here. All right. <laughs> However, in my next life, I am going to become an assassin of hackers, but we won't talk about sure, that. Sure, okay. Um, nobody and, has nobody's paying attention. Yeah, and, and <laughs> my wife has a cat. I don't take ownership of it because I have nothing to do with her acquiring it. And she, the cat jumps up on the counter to get some food, and my wife puts her on the floor, and the cat jumps back up, puts her on the floor. But, that's kind of where we're at right now, mm -hmm. is the hackers hack, and we put up a new firewall, sure. and then they figure out what to hack. Yeah. That's the fundamental issues that I'm not sure how to even research fundamentally to come up with a solution, short of assassination. This. Any ideas? I would recommend not assassinating anybody, <laughs> first and foremost. But, I really, you know, but that's why I think the training comes into play. How are you educating people to stay ahead of that curve? I mean, because... You mean ethically ed educating them to not? How do you unethically ed educate somebody? Yeah, that's, yeah. To make them not want to have fun by breaking the rules? Because they're going to anyway. So it's, it's trying to figure out how you can, how you can change that, how you change the, the mentality. If everybody knows that somebody's going to hack into their system, it makes it harder for that somebody to hack into a system. But that's all based on education. Yeah. Sir? When you're looking at uh, trying to find new ways of say, trying to defend against this, what uh, is being done to start engaging uh, younger players in this? The reason why I'm asking is that, especially with the uh, uh, advocacy of STEM groups, mm -hmm. uh, Orange County being an example of that, sure. there's actual hacking groups that are being instructed in how to do this in our public education system, starting as young as eighth grade. Mm -hmm. And one of the big issues that I've run into with trying to find folks uh, on my other side as a reservist that are qualified to do this is a lot of the requirements for uh, government uh, hiring or cybersecurity groups that are out there is they're looking for qualifications that are significantly older and not addressing a massive talent pool that is coming out of high school and middle school. Yeah. Um, is, there being any, is there anything that you've seen being done to alleviate some of those requirements? Uh, the basic of one, looking at possibly opening up some of these career fields to people without a bachelor's degree? It's mm. a good question. The reason and why I ask that as well is you've got guys coming out of the military, I'm a signals guy. Yeah. Uh, you've got guys coming out with 20 years and no bachelor's degree, and you will not get hired in this industry without a bachelor's degree in a lot of in a lot of places. But you got 20 years of experience, and you guarantee they will outpack a lot of people. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good, that's a great question. That's some some I, I don't I don't have the, the answer for it. So, you know, but she may have one back there. <laughs> Cyber vigilance in particular, and so it's more certification based because you have know, years of experience, but it may not be a bachelor's or you know have an engineering degree. So cyber vigilance and that kind of addresses what you're talking about too. Is it gets at the detection <coughs> earlier as opposed to later, right? Um, so how do you identify as a as a system, meaning the human and the computer, and identifying algorithms? And you may actually have the human at the front end of the uh, picture where they're doing some of the identification so that it is more engaging and not just relying heavily on automation and using the automation on the back end to actually double check um, the human side of it. So, there's also a point where there's education and training that there's a, a place where policy has to come in. Mm -hmm. like UCF just had a day long cybersecurity talk that more panelists and um, one of the former, the former deputy director of the FBI. And one of the students in the front row at the end raised her hand, a little bit frustrated, and probably a little bit smug, and said, I just want to point out that it's a federal offense for me to download an illegal song. But North Korea just hacked into Sony, and they got temp they got charged with something. Um, it, was, it wasn't even a... a um, it wasn't even a federal offense, it was charged with like unlawful communications mm -hmm. or something like sure. that. And so 
one of the folks there was former Microsoft, and he said there's a point where industry has done a better job of lobbying for protections than the public domain. And the former FBI person, deputy director, was saying that the FBI caught up very late with technology and, and a lot of the national organizations. Yeah, and that's the reality. In, industry is always, is always faster to react to things or, or have solutions for situations. Yeah, just some general comments. Uh, a lot of people think, well, the hacker, that's just some poor, lonely person that's really good in there. What do you really have to worry about is the nation state and the criminals. Because then somebody might hack into your system and leave a, a funny message for you just for fun. That's something you've got to worry about. You have to worry about industrial espionage. You have to worry about malware. One of the popular ones is uh, called ransomware. Well, again, you get a message that says, hey, your computer is dead to you unless you send me this money. And it's a business. If you don't send the money, uh, it's gone. And if you do send the money, you're good to go. Okay, so it's the, the wily hacker of your, it's not, not the same. Uh, workforce is a problem. The state of Florida has started a $28 million program to develop the workforce. So, so the, you know, how do you train people and how do you bring them up? Uh, you are not going to build a perfect infrastructure. That's, that's a disadvantage. It's also a beauty for us because we have worked forever with training people. And, uh, we have so this is just something that we'll have for us. By definition, any complex systems such as these are, even if all the elements are perfect and they're not, the interaction of them will create core problems. And similarly, you are part of the How many of you think you have a strong password? Or that you have some obscure thing that nobody will ever guess? Okay. Does UCF in the state have a strong password criteria? Okay, is having special characters and, and all that really better than just having a really long text string? Well, if you work the math, you find out you're better off with a long passphrase than you are with all these character things. What's the reason? Well, kind of rhetorics. 40 characters is about to break down four or ten. And the other part is you're not going to remember your password. You're going to write it down someplace. You're going to use the same one once you memorize it. That's a huge problem. So this is a problem from the end user all the way up. Most of the interesting hacks aren't all that interesting really. There are hardly any tour de force hacks. Uh, when you look at it, they're totally amateurish. That, that was the case with the target one. Uh, they knew that they had been hacked. The firm that they hired told them they had been hacked, and they didn't act on it. So is that a technical problem or some other kind of problem? One of the reasons your credit card interest starts at 16% and your bank account pays you a tenth of a percent <laughs> is because all these things that you with this cost money. And they pay the losses out of their fees. So there's an economic issue associated with it too. So it's an interesting issue. So the training is for everybody from whoever deals with these systems to people who build them. Uh, we're not interested in training the hackers, but understanding the mentality is very important. It's so people understand these systems very well. And uh, psychologists taught me that mental model is important. Okay. How many people here have any clue? how the internet works, or how the computer works, or why some things are good to do and some not to. Not to. You know, it just works. Uh, so that's another educational thing. Why would it be bad just to click on this link? Hey, it says back <coughs> And so you get scammed. That's all training. It's education. He was, he was next. Go ahead. Um, one of the, uh, the downfalls I can see with, with, with this type of training that we should be avoided is that silo training, basically training everybody in one individual unit. Yeah. Because we know the cyber community is a community. Sure. Information moves real fast. Everybody is collaborating. Mm -hmm. I'll learn this trick. We spread it. Exactly. Like, like, so we train individually instead of like more of a simulation where, like right now, online gaming is big. Mm -hmm. Orgies are big. Communities grow faster that way. Information is spread faster that way. So I think the advantage of maybe training in the MMOG type sure. of environment will be just as advantaged as the way the cyber community works because they don't work in silos. Mm -hmm. you know, they work. And that, and, and that may be all dependent on, on what the task is, what you're trying to teach them, what you're trying to train them on too. It's a great point. So you just we, we're trying to right now figure out what's the most effective way, yeah. whether team or individual. And it's just, it's it's 
it's the wild wild west right now. Information sharing can be the problem. Yeah. Because I learned a new trick yeah. to stop this this cyber attack. Mm -hmm. My stop or well, my uh, ability to stop it for me to share with him and him before he even gets to him is already spread. So he's already figured it out exactly. Figured you know, out. based on social media, it yeah. just it ex expands in, in, exponentially. I get it. But we train on an MMOG type type environment. Mm -hmm. Instantly, when I say, "Hey, I stopped this guy from getting in," yeah, we are already connected. They already see it. They see so, yeah. So they're already we're already you know in lock and step with each other, just like the cyber humans lock and step with each other. And if they know how to protect it, then somebody else is trying to figure out how to attack it again in yeah. a different way. Yeah. yeah. So it's like it's going back to what Ron says. How do you? It's cat and mouse. So you're always chasing. I think we're always behind the gate. We behind the, the, the gate because. We're so lockstep mm -hmm. where the cyber community is so instant. Oh, they have no rules. Yeah. yeah. And they're connected. They yeah. also, they're all connected. Absolutely. Yeah. Community. So, given that cyber threats are really a moving target, kind of this dynamic, they change a lot, why would you want a high fidelity environment, which are expensive and time consuming, and not one that really just has psychological or cognitive fidelity, mm -hmm. that is, that really helps people understand what the process is? problems are of the threats as opposed to something that simply looks realistic? Well, I, that's a good question. That's a good point in that I think it's going to be a combination of combination of both. You want someone that's going to be look that it's going to look good to be engaging. I mean, you want somebody to say, oh, let me let me let me let me take this training. It looks cool. I will continue going. I will take it more serious. But it's also got to be psychologically sound in order to give the, the necessary uh, thing you're trying to train them on. So it's a, it's a combination. That's what we're trying to figure out now, which is which is the most effective way. It could be a, a gaming environment. It could be excessive positive feedback. You know what is going to what's going to get somebody to to be properly trained? It's going to be a combination. Sammy. Hey there. On the topic of the last two questions, yes. I'm wondering about uh, what kind of reading uh, and thoughts you've had on responsive training and experimentation, as in training people to, uh -huh. on how to respond to real time active. <laughs> Threats and cyber threats. Yeah, that's that's a great question. So, so basically, reactionary to, to a threat. Yeah. Okay. Be, because uh, I guess to elaborate, you were talking about these different trainings that, mm -hmm. at best, they're uh, a bunch of animations with sure. slides, and it stops and questions mm -hmm. you. What do you think you should do, mm -hmm. or do you know this knowledge list? Of yeah. Things? But what do you think about? What have you read about what I've talked about? I, I, what I've read is there's not much out there in that that's doing kind of what we want it to, in the cyber world at least. Yeah. We all in, in other domains this happens all the time for training, but in the cyber world it's it's just not a lot out there right now. And what I'm trying to do is just come up with some sort of foundation, something that's gonna it's gonna lay out okay this is an effective way to train this aspect of cybersecurity. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna solve I'm not looking to solve the whole cyber world. I'm just trying <clears> to <throat> figure out one little component, one little human aspect of it that I can look into and say this may help the situation. Ma'am. Eric, have you um, looked into what the Institute is doing? Yes. Yes. They were here just last weekend for the BIS conference. Yes, I've read, I read a lot of their stuff. I haven't. I didn't. I didn't know they were here. I would have loved to talk to them. But I have seen all this stuff. I wrote a lot of papers on their stuff. Yeah, what I did not. I was not aware that they are an accredited university. Through Carnegie Mellon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, um, one of the things that they have. Is called the Cyber City. Yes. It's a physical model, mm -hmm. and it has all this data controls for the electric mm -hmm. grid and all that. But you know, one of the reasons why they're trying to use this physical environment for place-bound, time-bound training is to get some of the people to understand all the impact and the implications. And I was just sitting there going, Why isn't this yeah. done in a virtual world? And a lot of it is done, you know, to understand. Uh, you bring the power grid down, or you. You know, this firewall is down, but but I'm interested in the human aspect and, and that that component of it. You know, behavior. Why? What's making somebody hack into a system? Why do they want to? Why do they want to get into the system? You know, what makes them keep, keep trying to go around and, and 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 get in? It's electronic graffiti, because they can. Yeah, because yeah, it's there. It's why not do it? It's exciting. It's they can do it. They have to work at it. Uh, they don't want to work at real work because it's not as exciting as sure. working into it, hacking into things. You can, you can be anonymous. Oh, what I did. You can be anonymous, or you can be you can tell everybody. Sure. You know, but still be anonymous. You can tell everybody and still be anonymous. That's 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 the world we live in. Bernie, uh, I mentioned that sort of looking at what causes somebody to go on the offense, trying yeah. to take down the network. Is uh -huh. there anything being done to study what the 
indicators are that would uh, be on the defensive side that people may be missing from the human factor that we wouldn't allow them to notice the indicators stating that yes, this network is under active assault? Well, they have they have people that currently even like a penetration tester. Is that what you're asking about? Basically, what, what's being done to try and harden the people that are actually watching the networks to try and help them better defend against an attack, yeah. especially once one has been detected, sure. and give them the tools to actually be able to actively defend against an active mm -hmm. assault. That's that's all based on training, and it's 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 a growing field. It's not it's not an, it's not exactly. I can't say yes. They are doing this right now. It's growing and, and changing every day because because the cyber events happen every day. So you've got to, you've got to adjust fire every moment on a new situation. Okay. Eric, so a different things to talk about here. Are you more interested in? What motivates somebody to cyber attacks, mm -hmm. which is different than like training per se, sure. understanding and maybe then trying to mitigate and intervene so that they don't do that, mm -hmm. versus training, which I think this gentleman is training on the people that are responsible for monitoring the system. You know, can we give them better skills to detect the attack or more vigilance kind of thing? I'm more interested in the, in the person that's why they're doing what they're going to do. And, and can I create an environment that can train people to be able to monitor that and understand why these people are doing what they're doing? In a virtual environment. That, that's what I'm interested in. Anybody else? Sabrina? I imagine you reviewed some case studies sure. in your research. Mm -hmm. um, of, the, of the motivations mm -hmm. for cyber attacks, were there any that you found a pattern, or were there any that even surprised you hadn't considered before? Somebody, somebody, somebody motivated to hack mm -hmm. why they wanted to get in there? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I could say there's, there's a pattern. It's just they somebody is, is thriving to get in. It becomes an addiction like anything else. So somebody's saying, man, let me see if I can get into this guy's computer today. Got there. Let me see if I can get into his computer today. Got there. I really want to start hacking, but I can't. Let me try his. And you just keep going down the road. It, it, cyber, it's, it's a, the hacker is almost like an addictive personality. That's what I've seen. Ma'am. Just going back to some of your people you were asking before, too. Is you know Eric did a good job of providing a lot of background, but the one piece that you maybe didn't describe as much is the offensive versus the defensive, and that goes both on um, the the side of trying to protect, right, as well as on uh, the hackers themselves too. And so it sounds like you know what you were saying is again we need to identify uh, where the offender is coming from in order to first be able to defend better, and then create. Um, more of the offensive tools for that. And again, today the only thing I'm aware of is the cyber vigilance. There's not a, a reconciliation among all of the branches as to <laughs> as to uh, you know where we should be at uh, within the continuum of offensive and defensive. And I think part of that is because there's a lack of understanding of what offensive really means. The offensive, as opposed to the defensive, which currently is the reactionary. So if that makes sense. Absolutely. There you go. <laughs> um, do you what? Do you know the uh, the age range or uh, I guess of the age range of, of cyber hackers that probably been identified or called? I don't. So that's a good question. I don't know the age range, but I I could have, I can guess it's it's very wide. I mean anybody. Anybody can do it, and anybody is doing it. So I'm curious because you know, we're we transitioned from an analog generation to a digital generation, mm -hmm. and um, motivations from the two are not different. Like my daughter's 15; she cannot live without her phone, anything digital. Yeah, mine's 19. She yeah, does the same thing. she's addicted to everything that's digital. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if maybe you know, the motivation could be just a, a fundamental understanding of the generation of engaging in. Like gamers, you know, they, yeah. they're they're stuck into the avatar, but in their in their world, the avatar is real, and it's a personification themselves. So I'm thinking maybe if psychologically, dopamine may be a different mm -hmm. firing, different for hackers. Maybe I I just know as technology increases, I have a three year old nephew, and that that dude is better at games than I am. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I play video games, and this, he's three years old, and he can get into any system. So they're they're learning and growing faster and faster. So you know. It's, it's just, I, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. It would be two different motivations. I mean, motivation from somebody who's trying to attack something mm -hmm. uh, financially versus somebody who's trying to attack something for fun. I don't yeah. think it's financial. I think it's really curiosity. I think they just see it. Financial institutions have a more complicated set of firewalls than the 
that a Home Depot does or, or whatever. So that's the next challenge. Is can I get into that one? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it, now I think it's this is the like the uh, mafia is not doing over cyber security now or cyber attacks now. Like when the Russian guys are hacking through, there is now a lot of money yeah. to where they'll make more money on cyber crimes than they would in. Like exactly because so, it's because you can be anonymous yeah. and, you can, and you can have a widespread. So it's not kids for fun now. It's actually now. Oh, it's bringing, it's bringing in, it's bringing yeah, in so money. It's, it's yeah. So money. and as soon as it becomes financial, everybody's going to try to tap into that. So sure. motivations. Yeah. I mean, you have your hackers that want to, that are motivated to get in just to get in, yeah. and you have your hackers that are motivated to get in to 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 make money off this of all the situation. So one could be one one can want to get in to gain notoriety. One can get in because they want to make money. Yeah. So. Information right now is worth a lot of money. Yeah. Anybody's any other questions? No? Good? All right. So All right. that was my talk. I hope you enjoyed it. And, and again, this is uh, the foundational. We're going to get deeper. I still think assassinate. Do assassinate? I'm not doing that, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. I'm worried about all of them.